I came into the hairdressing industry on the back end of my modeling career. I modeled for Andy Warhol and Playboy magazine and all these things I had become mature and at a certain point you really don't care much about what anybody says about you. You care about yourself and you know who you are and how you are and what you want and you go for it. And that's when I was maybe 28, 29 when I first went into the beauty industry as an owner. I had worked part-time in New York and between modeling jobs I, would, I worked for this guy that owned a shop and he was uh, also uh, an instructor so he was able to instruct me and teach me uh, how to do hair, the technical parts of doing hair. And uh, so um, when I left New York and came back to Washington because at one point I worked for the FBI and I met J. Edgar Hoover and, uh, and I was terrified working for the government because in those days, in the 50s, if you were discovered to be gay, you were fired immediately. And here I was working for J. Edgar Hoover and we all have watched his story unfold. But in those days, there was never a word about his personal life situation. I met him and shook his hand and was given a $50 uh, meritorious service award for doing more fingerprint cards than anybody else in 30 days. $50 in 1957 was a whole bunch of money. And so, um, I decided that I'd better get out of the government because things were happening to me and I knew that um, my life was changing. Being a country boy and also realizing that there were things happening to me that were unusual and my feelings were unusual and I had no one to talk to about it. and. Um, but I did know that boys and men in America who were in the hairdressing industry, not all of them of course, but the majority were homosexual. And um, I was terrified of my own truth. And so I avoided that for many, many years. My mom was what they called a kitchen cutter. She never was a, a student of cosmetology. She just knew how to do it. She knew how to cut hair. She knew how to color. She knew how to give people perms. She cut men's hair and women's hair. And when I was a little boy, six, seven years old, my mom would hire me to sweep up hair. In the summer, she would cut hair on the back porch, and in the winter, she would cut hair in the dining room. And uh, so, I was her helper. And I, I fell in love with the camaraderie. I wasn't paying so much attention to the techni technical parts of doing hair, but I loved the conversation, and I loved my mom dealing with all these people and their ups and their downs and what was going on with their husband or wife and children and I, I liked it. I kept my mouth shut but my ears were wide open. Diana McClellan from the Old Evening Star column called The Ear. She was our cheerleader when Charles and I opened the salon in 1969 and Diana McClellan started coming to us and we would go out with her in the evening and 
she she loved us and we loved her and uh, you might say in a way that she put us on the map because we were in the ear column all the time. Charles and Roy, I called him Charles Ann because everybody said Charles Ann Roy. So I'd be in a grocery store and I'd go, Charles Ann? <laughs> One lady said, no, is that a boy or a girl? I said, I don't know. His name is Charles Ann. <laughs> we had fun everywhere we went because we were so out and so unafraid. We had a beautiful gold Rolls Royce and we would hire a driver on Friday nights to take us to the live discotheques in those days. Donna Summer and the music. And we would be dressed in turbans and all different kinds. We did not have clothes, we had costumes. And we would run into these clubs and hit the dance floor and throw cards up in the air. And the cards all said, this entitles you to one free haircut at Charles the First. And we built our clientele by giving ourselves away because we started with no clients. We had to build our business. Two boys in our late 20s, no money. And within four years, we had four salons and almost 100 employees and um, bought a big house off 16th Street, put Marilyn Monroe in the bottom of the swimming pool. It's still there. It was protected for 15 years because the uh, football coach uh, from Georgetown University bought the house and he didn't like swimming pools, so he covered it. So it was covered for 15 years and the beautiful artistry of John Bailey it still exists today there. Joan Rivers, I did her hair for seven mornings in the late 1980s. I went to the Madison Hotel and met her at 7.30 in the morning for seven days. And when I first walked in and her husband uh, took me to her bathroom, she was in a beautiful feathered negligee and she, <laughs> she looked at me and she said, oh, for God's sakes, another Gemini. And I said, not only that, we share the same birthday. She went, get out of here. I can't deal with me. <laughs> but we fell in love. We fell in love with each other, and I just adored her. She was an absolutely incredible human being. And at one morning after I had finished her hair, uh, she asked me if I would go down the elevator with her uh, to pick up something from the front desk, and I said, sure. So we got on the elevator and stopped on another floor, and this lady got on and recognized Joan Rivers, and she immediately turned her back to us. It was just the three of us in the elevator. And Joan said, can you believe you're on an elevator with Joan Rivers and her sexy hairdresser? <laughs> and the woman turned around and said, no, I can't believe that, and my daughter just loves you. So Joan took her to the front desk and wrote her daughter a short note. And she was that kind of lady. I, I just fell in love with her. Everything about her was just natural and normal. And uh, she went right to the point every time. And I, I was robbed and beaten and sexually abused by two Marines. And um, that messed me up for a little while, you know. Um, I thought maybe I would be a writer because I couldn't tell that story, especially the sexual abuse part. When the police came, after people found me on, on the dark alley in North Virginia City Park where I was working selling produce from a truck. 
and these two Marines came by every day and they would buy tomatoes and stuff like that. And uh, they were maybe like 19, 20, 21. And um, I was 13. And they, they were so nice to me. They were very friendly to me. And um, I looked forward to them coming. And then one night they asked me to go to uh, City Park, <clears throat> which in Norfolk is like an amusement park. And it's open it was in those days every night. And I felt so grown up that they would invite me to go with them. And they were in uniform and everything. And I just felt, I mean, there were parts of me that the doors had not been open. But I knew they were there. And I felt them. And so off I go with these two guys. And everything was fine until we were headed back. Uh, to my my truck, which I stayed in that truck like many other young people in those days, especially boys from the country. We were hired for 20 bucks a week to take care of these um, trucks and sell produce during the day for five days a week. And on the way back from the city park, um, things got strange. And one disappeared in a dark alley called me over and the next thing I know um, I was in a shock and, um, and then the very next thing that happened was all these people looking down at me and ladies screaming and the police were there and they asked me what happened and I told them everything and they said no we, we don't talk about that part and he said, you just forget about that part. But they robbed me, and they stole all the money that I had made that day, and then I watched my grandmother had just given me. And um, of course, uh, they put me in a uh, police car. All this happened within 15, 20 minutes. And I, I saw the two guys walking on the street. So the siren went on, and the police jumped out, and they found my watch and money. I think we were talking about $20, $25 in those days. This is like 1952, 53. And uh, they arrested them, and they, uh, we went to court. And all the time, I was not able to tell the truth of what they really did to me. And, um, of course, my father was there and my mother, and uh, so they, they uh, were found guilty, and then they were court-martialed. So first a civilian trial, and then they had to go into a military trial also. So it was a, a real experience for me to be on the stand, because I really liked those guys, and I couldn't believe what they did to me, you know. And of course, I was moved, moved from the city market after that. My parents said, you're never going back there again. But that started um, a real problem with me about my secrets and my secret life and what I was going to do. And my father was not amused with me because I wasn't like other boys in the community and how come I didn't like football, and what are you doing being a cheerleader, and all this stuff, you know. So it was very, very difficult for me growing. Writing saved me. I pretended that I was a writer, and I bought um, some magazines and books to write in, and I thought I was a newspaper reporter, and I would just write all my thoughts and my dreams and my hopes in, in these books, and then I got afraid that my father would find the books and read them, so I stopped writing. And I didn't get back into writing until four years ago. I mean, I always kept notes and stuff, but seriously writing about life. And, uh, but even with all the exposure there is in the world, with television and cell phones and uh, you name it, TikTok, all, all of it, it does not mean a thing to that 12 or 13 year old boy or girl 
that turns off the light in their bedroom at night and go, what the hell is wrong with me? I can't live. So those are the people that I want to talk to and share that you can, you can live and you can find a way. Once they find a way, their entry into society as we know it today is going to be much more gentle than it was uh, for me in the 50s and 60s and how far do we want to go back to Tchaikovsky, you name it, all the way back to Russia. <laughs>
if I would go back to back in time, I would have chosen Tony Perkins over Warren Beatty. Now Warren Beatty did shampoo, but I didn't care for shampoo because it didn't put hair it didn't put male hairdressers in very good light, particularly when he went to a bank for a loan, and the bank person said, "Well, what collateral do you have?" And Warren said, I don't know what you're talking about. What is collateral? And it put hairdressers in a very strange place because I know what collateral means. <laughs> I felt real bad about that and I didn't like the movie because of that. <laughs> but anyway, Tony Perkins would have been perfect to play Roy.